Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Hear Her Sports, the female athlete podcast featuring intimate profiles with female athletes, coaches, and other women in the sporting world. I am your host and producer, Elizabeth Emery. Today, I'm talking to registered dietitian Starla Garcia. She guides runners to eat and feel better in their sport and way beyond. Starla is also a speedy and dedicated runner herself. She just had a stellar run in her first 50-mile trail race. Starla tells us about fueling for endurance runs, electrolytes, a current favorite topic of mine, her interest in native cultural foods, carbs are good, underfueling not good, some practical tips for stacking habits, that's her awesome term, the importance of preparation, supporting her Latina community, and how purpose motivates her running. Starla's Instagram is filled with nutrition tips and running stuff. Find her at Starla underscore shines. In our conversation, Starla mentioned several inspiration books she read. All of those are linked in the show notes and available on Hear Her Sports Bookshop page. When you use the link to our shop, a percentage of the sale goes to this very podcast to support our production costs. We love when you buy from Bookshop and send you all sorts of good thoughts in advance for doing so. Let's get started. Starla Garcia is a registered dietitian, Olympic trials marathon qualifier, and founder of The Healthy Shine, a sports nutrition and coaching consulting practice in Houston, Texas. Starla was a D1 track and field and cross country runner at the University of Houston. There she was diagnosed with an eating disorder. Thanks to care and support of some teammates and a coach, she faced that and worked hard to recover. Her experiences now inform her work with other athletes. Welcome Starla, thanks for making time to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm definitely eager to chat with you and yeah, share my experiences with your audience. Nutrition is such a broad field and I have been talking to a few nutritionists lately. So I'd love to hear a bit more about, you know, the areas that you find particularly interesting and like to focus on. So the areas that I particularly find interesting on a personal level, I would say Through the pandemic, we did a genetic test, my family and I, and we always knew that we were of Mexican indigenous roots and we were finally able to link those over and what we actually were. Even before that time, I was noticing that in the pandemic, my partner and I, who's also, he has indigenous roots in Nicaragua, we had started to really see that we felt better with more cultural foods. And so I had a couple of native clients who I was speaking to around their histories of food and things like that and health disparities around food and what does food mean for them. And so I started to do a whole deep dive on native cultures around food and their philosophies around it. And there's a whole area of food sovereignty that is tied into environmental work. And so... I've started to really dive deeper into what is food sovereignty and what are cultural foods and how do my cultural foods influence the way that I think, feel, behave, and move through the world. Wow, that's awesome. That sounds really fun. Yeah, it's been really neat to uncover and really explore that area also with clients who are BIPOC athletes and really introducing and reframing cultural foods in a way that it promotes more health for them. You mentioned that you feel better when you eat sort of your own cultural foods. Can you talk about that a bit more? Like what kind of foods and what did you notice in the way that you feel? I started to feel more connected and I always knew this way back in college where I would start to get really homesick. Um, And I was away for long periods of time for like the first time of my life. And, you know, I was a year round athlete from going from cross country to track and then doing summer training. 
going into my senior year of college, I stayed year round. I did summer classes. So there were long periods of feeling homesick and I started to cook more of my my foods from home, the foods that my mother would make for me whenever I would come back. And so I noticed that whenever I would start to feel like that, I would feel so much better when I would do it and I would just feel more connected. There is a phrase in native communities where, and I'm, I'm totally butchering this, but it's also whenever you are too away from the land, you need to go back and feed your soul. And so whenever we have more of our cultural foods, we start to feel so much more connected to our family and we don't feel alone. You always feel like you are more peaceful, you feel loved, you feel supported through the foods. And not just in a physical way, in a healing way, but also in an emotional and mental way. And so whenever I eat foods like beans, rice, corn, tortillas, things with corn masa, those are the things that I feel more connected to. And and I think there's a lot of shaming that can happen around a lot of these foods that because they're so carbohydrate dense. But as an endurance athlete, I started to really see like, no, whenever I have my cultural foods, what is the history behind them? What is the history of corn in Mexico and what is the history of things like the males and things with masa and it was to provide endurance and long lasting stamina for people that were going to go out for long periods of time to do work. I understand through Deanna Bellany, who was the person who recommend that I reach out to you, that the field of nutrition is not diverse at all. So what have your experiences been? Um, I guess during your education, but also in your professional life and dealing with clients, I mean, because it, there's not very much diversity, I would think that a lot of clients would be interested in working with you. A lot of BIPOC clients would be interested in working with you. Yeah, uh, professionally, I do have a lot of BIPOC clients that want to work with me specifically because they realize that they don't have to give up their foods to perform well. And I think that was something that we have heard a long time in nutrition information, marketing, education, even on media platforms. Like there's not a lot of content that is catered around cultural foods or implementing them. If they are, they're more termed as like superfoods. But how do we include like rice and beans, things with masa on a daily basis that we can see that are are also health promoting? I think in my my undergraduate work, it was very clinically focused. So we were looking at how do we heal somebody through medication, health promoting behaviors, but it wasn't ever how do we include cultural foods? Like there was a lack of culturally sensitive and competent material. I think maybe the first time I really had it was in my graduate work where I was looking at health disparities and I was doing research on it and we were looking at, you know, Latino families that were less assimilated were actually healthier. And the more assimilated they became, they started to have more of the health issues that we see. When I read about that and we were wondering why was that happening? How do we measure assimilation? How do we measure acculturation? All of those things. I was like, huh, I was like, this is very interesting to me. And it just stuck with me over the last decade of, you know, now being a professional in the field. How do I encourage that my clients go back to their cultural foods and how can I teach them ways to implement them and how do we talk about them? How do we reframe them? And how do we also encourage families to come together again and eat these cultural foods? Are most of your clients runners? Yes, 100% of my clients are runners. Okay. So what are they coming to you for or why are they coming to you? What are the issues that make them want to work with a nutritionist? Um, so the issues that they may be having may be stemming from their relationship to food, maybe their relationship to exercise. A lot of them, they want to run better and feel better. They want to run stronger. They want to run faster. So it's a lot of performance based. And then there's also clients that just really want to be consistent and they want to learn how to eat well on a daily basis. Some of them may be having difficulty with transitioning from a beginner level and they want to get faster, but they don't know why. Or maybe just a fueling strategy for an upcoming race, like a marathon or trail run, whatever it is that they have on the agenda. And did you learn a lot about sports nutrition in school? 
I had a class on sports nutrition, but very little. It was interesting because when I started in my dietetic internship, I wanted nothing to do with sports nutrition. I wanted it to be very separate. I wanted to keep it to myself. I wanted running to just be my thing, and I didn't want it to mesh with my career. I thought that I could have two separate lives, and that was the way to be sustainable. And that was coming from a fear of maybe relapse during my dietetic internship. And in my early years of being a dietitian, I was just afraid of relapsing into my eating disorder again and getting triggered. But through my own running and life after collegiate sports, I came back to running naturally and I started to really get an itch to to work with athletes again. I knew that that was my population that I really wanted to work with because I just would hear all of this diet chatter all the time from other runners or through, you know, when I would go to like running groups and things like that. And I was just like, wow, there's so much that I could help and inform this community of and I could really change the way that they're thinking. It doesn't have to be like, like very extreme behaviors to perform well. You can perform well and be consistent and have health promoting behaviors on a daily basis if we just reframe things. So I came back to sports nutrition out of, you know, just seeing that there were issues in terms of how people were consuming and interpreting and implementing information. It's so interesting how, you know, like athletes are so structured and focused and, you know, like you talk a lot about being a type A personality Mm -hmm. and yet nutrition seems like a place where we often get things wrong. Yeah, I think I think people just really want to be great at things. Sometimes too, I think nutrition is this gateway to other health behaviors that they want to improve. Um, and so they think that if they can control this one thing, everything else will get better. And we see that a lot in eating disorder treatment where if I'm just thinner enough, everything else will be better. And so I saw a very similar thought process with runners. And I think a lot of runners, they, they want to identify as one. They want to be part of a community. They want to get it just right all the time. And it's funny because there's a lot of being imperfect at it actually works to people's benefit because you can troubleshoot a lot better in a race. You can troubleshoot on a daily basis a lot better. So learning to be in the gray area and being imperfect allows for more flexibility long term. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think also, you know, like so many of us have this image of what a perfect athlete looks like, a perfect runner looks like. And I think about this a lot. And more recently, because I was having a conversation with a black woman who's about my age, so in her 50s, and we both had the same exact image of what, you know, like a great athlete looked like. And it looked like neither of us, which I thought was also interesting because we're both athletes. And and you've certainly talked about that kind of thing as well. It's like this this image that that none of us can live up to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think if we're constantly chasing this idea of perfection or perfect bodies, I think sometimes we fail to really see that the way to be the athlete we've always wanted is to just really accept and work with the body that we have because it's gotten us so far into that sport already. So if we just nurture it a little bit better, it just will perform a lot better for us. And I think, you know, for me as well, like being a minority in the sport was, I mean, I I think I had a lot of emotional intelligence when I was in high school to really see that, but I didn't understand what to do with it necessarily. I didn't see it as like purposeful or impactful. I just thought like, you, you know, how do I blend in more? How do I make myself good like everybody else and it was not like I'm good on my own I don't have to blend in the reason why I don't blend in is like I need to understand that that's actually very unique like I have something special here it seems like there's been more discussion about red s these days and also just you know the general idea of fueling for your sport and for performance is that my perception or are you seeing that as well I'm definitely seeing it as well which I think is great when we think about younger athletes. I think we do need to give a little bit more attention right now to the younger generation um, because I am seeing as well a lot of pressure from their peers and from themselves to be perfect all the time because their entire lives are now on social media. So 
I think there is a lot of additional pressure more so from when I was in school, like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. In terms of Red S, I think it's important to to really not just talk to younger girls about it, but I think also males as well, because I am seeing a big uptick in in males as well right now in teenage boys. So it's interesting because I do think as younger girls push for a more perfect image of themselves, we're also seeing that males are also feeling that they need to be as equally perfect. Hmm. And your clients and the people that you've worked with, are they fueling properly when they come to you? Or is that one of the big things that you're sort of instructing them on? Yeah, so I'd say across the board, you'll see a lot of dietitians, particularly in endurance sports, talk about underfueling a lot. And it's because I think people think they're overeating all the time. But at some point, they're having underfueling happen. Maybe it's intentionally or unintentionally, and that leads to the overeating. So you have to first identify and encourage an athlete to fuel and stop underfueling so they can stop the overeating happening. So they just find themselves in this cycle. But in order to really solve the problem, you have to solve the underfueling first. How does that cycle work, the underfueling, overfueling? It can be, you know, maybe we have an adult athlete that's waking up at four in the morning, they go for the run at five or 4.30, they rush to work immediately after, maybe they have to take their kids to school, they rush to work after and they totally skip breakfast. Mm. And by the time they know it, it's 10.30, 11, they've been up for already six hours with nothing. And then they start having a lot of aches and pains, hamstring issues. Maybe they're craving a lot of things later on in the day. Maybe they end up overeating at lunchtime and so forth. Or maybe they completely miss lunchtime because they have a really demanding work schedule and they can't pull away. Or maybe they're stuck in meetings and so forth. Like that is underfueling. So how do we make it easy for that person to transition from one thing to another as seamlessly as possible? So what are the skills that you're sort of, yeah, like, I mean, how do you solve that? So what we would do is just assess, you know, what are they like? What are they willing to do? Um, Maybe it's a mindset issue. Maybe they think I'm intermittent fasting. Can I give them some education around intermittent fasting? How does it impact females? How does it impact males? What is it going to do to their performance? So really providing evidence-based nutrition recommendations and encouraging them, hey, research is saying it's not benefiting you. I don't know where you found this or just saying in a much more, you know, comforting manner, right? So things like that, and then helping them identify ways to actually implement. Can we pack a protein shake? Can we pack a peanut butter sandwich and a drinkable yogurt? Can we have something else? Can we at least start maybe fueling before your run? Can we implement intra-run nutrition as well to help with your recovery nutrition process a lot faster? Is there something close by to your work? Where do you work? Does your office provide snacks? Can we pick up a snack on your way into the office? Can you keep things in your cubicle? Things like that, I think that's where dietitians are always thinking about and helping helping solve the issues that the person is having. So how can we stack habits on top of where their flow of their day is? I was struck also by one of your Instagram posts where you were talking about preparation. I mean, a lot of the hints that you were giving right there are, are, is just about thinking about it in advance, sort of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's thinking about it in advance. And sometimes too, it's um, some people, they will work their tail off until they feel like they deserve it. Mm. That's a mindset change that I have to make with clients. And there's a lot of people out there that will work themselves to the ground. And they're like, okay, finally, I got X, Y, and Z thing done. I'm going to take a lunch break. Right. And it happens very often. Yeah. You also mentioned intermittent fasting. I thought that was sort of over. Are people still doing that? Oh, people are still doing it. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Um, Yep. I think we've all also learned collectively, or I think at least um, in even in the dietetic world that, you know, that it doesn't help with hormones or, you know, recovery nutrition at all. It impacts female hormone systems as well, all of those things. So it just makes it so much harder for your body to recover and to actually function the way that it's supposed to for us. I guess I want to get more into, you know, your endurance athletes that come to you and, you know, what are they struggling with most to solve? I mean, we talked a little bit about why they come to you, but then they're working with you. What are they finding difficult to, to, uh, I don't know, implement, I guess. I think some of the things that they really struggle implementing is 
I would say it's a lot of the mindset part of it in terms of being consistent. Like some people, maybe they've been dieters in the past and they just don't want to diet anymore. And so they kind of have PTSD from dieting. And so anything that they do on a regular basis that feels like dieting scares them because they don't want to, you know, rebound or also if they loosen up too much and they make choices that are more intuitive, they feel like they're just constantly giving in. So it's a delicate balance in terms of identifying people's value systems and helping them make decisions based off of value systems. And you are a advocate of intuitive eating, is that correct? Yes, yeah. I am an advocate of intuitive eating. I will say in sports nutrition, we do use a little bit more numbers than maybe dietitians that are 100% intuitive eating and healing relationships with food. But with sports nutrition, I do have to use numbers to maybe sometimes help somebody understand like, no, we do need to increase this amount or we need to feel this amount during your marathons. You can't be waiting until you feel bad. So I think instructing people on how to navigate intuitive eating with sports nutrition is the other, probably the other problem that most people come to me for. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, I mean... I know I'm just using myself as an example. And before competition, I get a little bit stressed out and my hunger cues are not reliable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's a big one where some people, they'll wait till they're hungry after workouts. And I have to encourage, no, let's actually have something cortisol suppressing ghrelin. And this is why you're not hungry. In order to get a true adaptation occur, we need to actually to help our body eat something or we need to find things that are going to be easy for you to consume if it's not going to be a full meal. So I think providing people with choices um, in terms of how did they want to approach their nutrition too is helpful. What do you recommend during training, like while you're running or during competition? So during competition, as a marathoner, my typical recommendations would be like gels, blocks, gummies, maybe some fluid as well to couple with it just to make sure the person has enough what they need per hour. For trail, it's going to be a little bit different. There's going to be more solid food choices and real food choices that are going to come up. So helping them identify which ones can they tolerate, which ones are going to be out on the course for them, and when and where do we have that option available. And do you give, you know, the numbers like you need X number of calories or carbohydrates per hour and they they aim for that? Yes. Yeah. So that's where I would put in more of the numbers of, hey, you need to have X, Y and Z amount. This is the minimum. Um, so that's 30 grams of carb per hour. Max is 80 to 90. Where is your sweet spot? We have to work together to figure that out. Are your runners good at eating during the running? I mean, especially at the pace that you're running, I would think that eating gels would be hard. Yep. So for depending on the pace that they're going, we identify what's going to be the best solution for them. And practicing really helps solve that. Um, some people start saying, you know, I really did, done nothing. I want to do gummies. And then when they do it in a race, I'm like, okay, but be aware, you know, you may not like it. I want you to practice it at this 10K because it's going to be similar to your race pace. You know, tell me how you like it. And then they end up saying, you know, I didn't like it. It was too much work. Can we try gels now? And that's what we'll end up switching out to. So practice really, really makes perfect when it comes down to figuring out what people are going to do. And how many gels are you personally eating during a marathon? I'd say I go up to maybe eight to 10. Eight to yeah. 10. And are you carrying those with you? Yep. I'm carrying them on me. Yeah. Wow. Well. Yep. So there is definitely ways to do it. And I think for a lot of my runners, when they hear that I carry that much and I'm carrying it without support in a marathon, because uh, that's against the rules for USATF, I can't get support. I always encourage just try stuff. Like trying is going to be the best way that you're going to solve issues. And I mean, it does take a little bit of economic resources too to do it. But I always encourage that people just invest in it. And if, especially if they're going to be doing this for a long time, why not just do it and figure it out right away? Can I ask, where are you carrying them? Oh, I carry them in sports bras. Um, you do? So there are sports bras that have pockets in them. And so I actually have one by Lululemon that I use all the time for my races because it's right up front. And so right under my singlet, I can reach in pretty quickly and grab my grab my gels. 
And it's also trying out different things. There's different sports bras out there. I have an addition from Lululemon that they don't even make anymore. And I still use that. I've bought shorts that have pockets on the sides. I have belts as well that I use to stuff stuff in. I've also in the past used Wazelle shorts that have pockets all along the the top of the of the shorts or right in that seam that fold. That's where I put gels and they don't even make that one anymore. Yeah, so as soon as I see stuff that I think would be helpful for a long run, training session, a future race, long run, I always just just grab it. And what about hydration? Where are you carrying that? Hydration, I usually pick up stuff on the course. Yeah, for my recent trail ultra, I used Brooks shorts and they had a side pockets and I used a Solomon vest. So that's where I carried my hydration and my nutrition. Um, and then I had like a backup Nathan belt. Mm-hmm. You've spoken in the past about running in the Olympic marathon trials and how you were one of the few Latinas there. That seems like a big moment for a lot of the Latina runners that were there. You know, just, I guess, seeing such a big group of women and not very many Latinas or people that look like them. Can you describe that? I think I was one of 25 women that were there. So I think it was neat to just be able to have a community. And I think there's just like this unspoken bond as well when you see another woman of color at that level competing with you. Because you know it just kind of took a lot. I think it took a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time. You probably had to get through high school and college to get there. And then being an adult too, like navigating that, that takes a lot of work. And I mean, not even doing it professionally. So it just takes a lot of additional time, effort, and putting things on hold just to do this one thing. And I think even culturally, too, there's a lot of expectations in terms of gender roles that a lot of women do have to manage in their personal life. So there's just a lot of respect, first and foremost, for women who I competed against or or ran with at the Olympic trials just for a myriad of reasons, right? Do you know how to encourage more Latinas to start running? I mean, from all levels. I mean, you know, you started at young, but young and also your age. I think a lot of it is based off of representation. I think we're a very motivated and lively community. And so I think when there is a group of women that come together, we see it. And there's definitely like Latinas run and Latinos run in Houston. That's like the main city that it's, it's in now. The founder of it moved to Houston recently, so we're seeing more of the groups happen, um, which is great. And I think in terms of representation, it really helps to eliminate imposter syndrome feelings. And I think we're seeing that across the board. And when we're more visible, it makes it more likely for groups like Latinos Run to, to exist. I think also having more community support as well in terms of getting women of all levels or Latino women of all of all levels more likely to come out because I think I think there is a lot of you know women are very at least like from what I've observed a lot of women don't feel like they are runners because they don't look like an Olympic athlete or they're not thin or you know they don't look like the the super elite athletes and so I try to really encourage that you know just by you being there you're gonna actually pull someone else out of their house to go and do the same thing because you've made them feel more comfortable doing it too. I so wish more people understood that they were athletic just by doing something athletic that you don't have to look in some certain way. Yep. I really think that everybody has a huge influence on each other. And I mean, we hear this all the time, right? The company that you keep really matters. But I think in terms of influence, just by getting outside of your door and running, it impacts the neighbor so much in that now they think, okay, if this person feels safe doing it here, why not? Like, I'm going to go do the same thing too. And then in turn, it just creates more communities to step outside and go to their trail and so forth. And they're actually just moved in the pandemic. We bought a house and there is a trail by our home and we've seen more and more women go out and get on the trail at earlier and earlier hours in the morning because they're seeing that there's a community and when there's more people around they feel safer that's been really neat to observe 
Thank you to all of our Patreon patrons. I'm so grateful for your support. November's bonus audio was a fantastic check-in with episode 50's biathlete Deirdre Irwin, who told us how she made the U.S. National A-Team, some tactics for race nerves, and about equity in her sport. You can hear that interview by joining our Patreon at the $5 level or above. Go to patreon.com slash hearhersports. Patreon may not be your thing. You can also make a one-time donation at hearhersports.com. All of your financial support helps fund the cost of putting the show together. Hosting the audio, website fees, the app I use to record calls with guests, and a few apps I use to improve the athlete guest experience. Your support makes a difference for us and beyond that. Supporting independent women-run sports media increases the percentage of sports coverage about women. Your help brings more female athletes into the spotlight so young girls and women can see what is possible. I want to get to your own training. What are you doing these days? So I just finished the JFK 50-mile race on Saturday on November wow. the 20th. Yeah, I definitely have to say thanks to Brooks Running for giving me the opportunity to do it. I had applied for it through their Run Happy Team Ambassador Program. They sent out an email and I was like, which one sounds like appealing and the only one that lit me up and made me excited and scared me a little bit was that race. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done anything past three and a half hours before. So my training runs were going up to like three, like four hours and 20 minutes. So that was new for me too. I hadn't really realized that. And I was a little embarrassed by that realization in this process that here I was helping clients that were running five hour marathons and had never even ran that long. I had no idea what it felt like to run that long. So it was a really big eye opening moment and really appreciative to my clients who run those lengths of time. Yeah, that's a long time to be out there. Yeah, yeah. I learned a lot in the process. And yeah, I gained a lot of humility, too. I like to think. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I ended up having a great day as a rookie. And yeah, I actually had a call with my coach today. And we're planning out some fun stuff for the year. Nothing super serious. But yeah, I'll be pacing the three hour group at Chevron Houston Marathon, which will be, I think, probably the first time they've ever had two females pace that group ever which is really fun and then there's another woman pacing the 305 group which is also really fun to see yeah that's so cool yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so women are definitely leading endurance sports right now at least in my world (laughs) yeah nice nice so what was it like to be out there for five hours so i finished the 50 mile uh race in just under eight hours so 757 um you know, I had never done, really done trail. I had like seven weeks to prep. I had six weeks of really solid training since the day that I found out that I got an entry. And then I had, yeah, so less than eight weeks to prep for it. Um, learning my fielding strategy, practicing everything, getting in 30 mile long runs. But yeah, it was really neat because I think once I got to four and a half hours, I saw the watch go off. I had a nutrition timer on it too, so I wouldn't forget my nutrition. So when four and a half hours started buzzing, I was like, all right, like you're definitely in uncharted territory. Like (laughs) you're doing fine. (laughs) Yeah, and I really approached it just very, um, I wanted to make sure I did it right because I didn't want to like have an issue happen. But I was just very open to whatever the outcome was. So I had no expectations whatsoever. And I ended up really enjoying it. And I took the time to to just fill my head with a lot of books written by authors that were women of color. Like that was a intentional decision I made that I was just going to learn from from these women and take in their wisdom in times that, that were really difficult for them. How could I translate it over to myself on race day and how can I use their wisdom for myself? And then just really exploring my indigeneity too. What books were you reading? I read Gabrielle Union's book. I read uh, Tarana Burke's book, which is fantastic if you haven't read it. I cried and I, I laughed so much in her book. I think too, it was... What else did I read? I read Four Brown Girls with Tender Hearts and Sharp Edges. That one was another great one. I read Wild Tongues as well. That one was great. 
let's see joy luck club that was another one yeah so i really just tried to expand my own literature over the last year and those were very intentional ones that i chose in this buildup. and so in my training runs or in my long runs where i wasn't running with people i would listen to them i love that i love the focus of that inspiration yeah it was it was like it was really neat because I don't think I'd ever done that in a training block. And I figured, why am I going to rely on the same things that I've done for marathons when I'm running double? I need new things to pull from. Describe what happens to your mental thoughts during those hours. <laughs> you definitely have a lot of, um, oh my gosh, this is so cool uh, moments. At least I did on the trail because I was on the Appalachian Trail. So the first 15 were on Appalachian and... I mean, I've maybe had like 10 total trail runs in my entire career. I'm glad that I had that one. Um, and that's always been a bucket list is to get on Appalachian. So I was on the Appalachian Trail for the first 15. And it was, don't fall on my face. Um, stay calm. <laughs> um, and oh my gosh, this is so cool. And then the other part of the race was, all right, get down, get some food in, get in some nutrition, switch out and go. Definitely just staying very calm for the next 30 miles was key for me. And I think just being very patient too, because I I definitely am still a competitor. I wanted to go and like catch up with everybody else because I'm so inexperienced at trail that I knew I was kind of, I was kind of in the middle, but I was in the front pack for the women. So I wanted to just kind of pick people off slowly and just use that as, you know, just to keep me as focused and keep it fun for me. I think like the next 25, so up to mile 40, I was able to stay pretty focused and that was really helpful for me. It was interesting because when I got to 40 mile mark, I was tired and I, I was acknowledging it already. Like, all right, you're tired. How do you want this to end now? Do you want to keep grinding it out? Do you want to go into the wall here? And I thought, well, you know, you still feel pretty good. You don't feel beat up. Like, that's great. Why don't you just like be gentle now, like use the gentleness you cultivated through your training runs. And that was an intentional thing I was thinking about too, was just to cultivate gentleness throughout the course of the cycle. And I really approached the last 10 very, I guess, very peacefully. I like took a break, I walked and I would run a mile, run a mile and a half, two miles, and then take like a 30 second walk break and then start over again. And just kind of breaking it up into smaller chunks just because I just didn't know how the rest of the race was going to feel. So I just was being very patient. And it was interesting because I've never really done that in a race, but it just felt fine. And it didn't feel like I didn't beat myself up over it. It was more of like, all right, like, this is neat. This is, this is okay. Like, you can be a competitor and you can, can also explore what this feels like too. I think it's hard to balance sort of the competitive drive that you talk about with also sort of enjoying the process or enjoying being out there and learning from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really just wanted to learn and see what it was like. And that was my main thing going into the race was just to learn and explore other parts of myself. And I think, you know, even seeing like how I read books and, you know, really took deep dives into my indigeneity, that was the main thing of it. And I had really signed up for it too, because I was seeing a lack of representation in trail running and ultra running. And I was just like, where are, where are we? Where are the people that look like me? And so that's what I really put in my application when I was applying for the, the entry was that I wanted to represent my community and I wanted to fill in the gap there. If it was just one more body there, then great. And that was really my intention. Even the last 10 miles was like, you know, like there's not a lot of women around you right now. You're, you know, you're one of how many Latina women out here, women of color, just take your time and be gentle because this is the point of today's race. Trail running is so different from road running. I'm impressed that you were able to manage it you know, for 50 miles without having done that much of it, you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, maybe it's my genetics. <laughs> 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 so 
Um, it's funny because my coach was like, I don't know what it was, but he's like, maybe it is in your genes. And I really do think a little bit of it is from my ancestry because I don't think that's, yeah, I mean, maybe it's some talent, but I don't think, yeah, I had to pull it from somewhere. Sure. What was your nutrition like? Did you change it from the marathon at all and how? It was slightly different. So my sodium was definitely higher per hour. So I went up to like 800 to 1000 milligrams per hour, which is pretty high. And I'm a salty sweater already. So there was that. And then I took in a gel every 30 minutes and my fluids had carbohydrates in it. So I definitely carried more on me and there were stops every 10 to 12 miles. So my family met me out on the course and um, we just switched out like my my water like I had it all planned out for them in a, like a little book in my bag like all right at this stop you're gonna do x y and z put in two scoops here and these other ones so I was switching out with bottles and then we would refill everything and then I would take water from the water stations if I needed to and then I was eating nutter butters as I could yeah nutter butters saw. yeah <laughs> nutter butters yeah <laughs> Trail runners eat some interesting things. There's ramen noodles, there's hot dogs out there, peanut butter sandwiches. There's also potato chips as well. So I took some potato chips at like mile 15. Yeah, uh, all kinds of stuff. Pickle juice, pickles. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to do another one? Um, yeah, I'd like to do another one just to just to also see. And now that I know what mile 40 to 50 feels like, I'm right. um, I was actually telling my coach that I think I could, I could shave off another 30 minutes off that time. So we'll see. I definitely, I mean, the women that I competed against were phenomenal. Uh, there was, I think the top 10 were all pros and I was 17th overall. And even then I was looking at where the other women live and they definitely live in hillier areas. And it was funny because in that one race, I got 3000 feet elevation gain. And I think I had like four weeks with that amount total yeah. <laughs> of training. So, yep. so I definitely have my work cut out for me for the next one I do, or if I do it next year, maybe my buildup would be a little bit different just to prep for it. But yeah, it was a really neat experience. And yeah, I'm very thankful for Brooks for letting me do it. What do you think you would change if you did it again, both during the, the lead up, but also during the race? Oh, I think my training would definitely help me a little bit better in my race. I think having more time to train on trail when maybe getting some elevation could have helped my trail time um, coming off of it. Um, maybe shaving off like 10, 15 minutes there. And then I think maybe transition wise, like having faster transitions available. Um, maybe instead of having like my family switch out my bottles, I probably would just allow the people there to refill me. So just mm -hmm. opening up my pack and then pouring in water and then I can mix it myself. Yeah. Did you have doubts when you were out there? You know, no, I didn't have any like any feelings of like, it's okay to drop out today or anything like that. I don't know what it was. I think, I don't know if it was maybe like the books that I read where it was like people enduring years of oppression and years of, you know, abuse and things like that and difficulties and challenges. But I related to their story so much because I felt like that was me for a really long time. So I didn't really feel like I was gonna DNF my race. Yeah, I think... I think also like I knew what the intention was for the race early on and it was to represent a community and it wasn't like start the line and drop out. It was like you're going to finish it and it's okay if you have to walk it because the whole point is just to represent your community. I'm glad you mentioned the salt intake and how you up the salt intake and could you talk more about sort of electrolytes and particularly magnesium because I've been dealing with some magnesium loss during running. And so I'd just be curious about what the body's going through during training and what happens. Yeah, so with electrolytes, I mean, athletes are special people. Sometimes we wanna listen to like the American guidelines for stuff, but it's also, I mean, you're an athlete nonetheless. So I try to encourage like, if there's salt on your skin, 
that's not necessarily a good thing. Like it means that, you know, your body is trying to find homeostasis for you, right? And bring down your internal temperature. But we also want to recognize like, how can we help our body? How can we help it not have to do that in future exercise? So that means increasing fluid. So that way you can actually keep fluid in the cell when cell exits the your body and onto your skin layer it's going to pull more water out with it too so it's like osmosis wherever salt goes water goes so that's the whole reason why we have salting out is because it's pulling water out from your cell your muscle cell in particular and your other functions that need water out with it so when that happens core temperature increases and you make yourself more likely for dehydration or heat exhaustion. And then also muscle cramping and fatigue because now we don't have those electrolytes to help with contractions. And it's not just like muscle contractions, it's also heart contractions because we have cardiac muscle. Hmm. So I think people forget about that too. Um, So electrolytes are super important. Probably my favorite thing to focus on first with a lot of runners because I'm in Texas and we have a lot of hot days here and I find that once I fix that, people start to feel so much better and it's a great way to also gut train too because you can find mixes that have carbohydrates in it and they're easier to digest for many people. So it's kind of like a threefold. I improve electrolyte, hydration, and carb intake and I start to gut train them. And so then I'll start to maybe implement some gels and pull them a little bit away from fluid so much because the likelihood of them wanting to carry so much fluid in a marathon or in a half marathon is very unlikely. So when I have them hydrated, then I can implement nutrition and then they have less stomach problems or stomach aches because now they're hydrated. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. I kind of like to do it that way. It's a little bit more lengthier, but... In the long run, it helps people really see the benefit of electrolytes at 100% capacity. What changes happen in terms of the sweating and the loss of electrolytes and magnesium and other salts during a person's lifetime, I guess? Yeah, so there are also minerals, right? So Mm -hmm. it can impact sleep. Um, And it can also impact hormones. So like thyroid issues, for example, those are a lot of mineral deficiencies. So I always try to encourage the electrolytes are a big thing that we want to solve for long-term purposes in terms of hormone, gut health, and even sleep and thyroid issues that many women do find themselves in or Hashimoto's or whatever that is for that person. So it's not even just like sports nutrition. I'm trying to improve, but maybe even prevent future issues from popping up for that person. Do you work with older women as well? I work with some women in menopause. I would say probably because I've never had children or I'm also not of the age. Maybe I don't have enough credibility or experience in those areas, but I do have a couple of them. Yeah, I'm going through perimenopause and I would never have imagined it's like it is so (laughs) right right I mean we're all learning from you guys and what I tell a lot of my clients who are going through it is like what a neat time to be exploring this because in turn I'm learning from you and then I can make it better for other people and not just that but really the women who are going through menopause now they are the first generation of female athletes or they have been right Um, maybe their parents or their mothers didn't play sports and they are the first one so we're also learning what's happening to athletic populations or women that are staying active for years of their life now like what a neat time to learn together yeah and we're finally in the position of having more female scientists and females Mm -hmm. who are around asking the questions so that we're being studied Exactly. Yep. So it's a really exciting time, I think, for female sports and female health across the board. What do you have planned for the future? I mean, for your business, for your running, for women in sports? That's a great question. I've been really like meditating and running and trying to really sort through a lot of my goals and my value systems around it. In terms of my 
my community here in Houston, there are a couple of things that I would like to do around trail running now knowing a little bit more and, you know, actually the women that really helped me learn it, they're older than me. They're in their early 40s and they really supported me and they helped me find routes and things like that that they felt safe with and the woman that I trained with for this race um, in Houston, she was in the top 40 overall for women and she's 47. So I mean, she was maybe like 50 minutes behind me. So she's pretty good, especially on that course. That was a tough trail course. So she really took me under her wing and helped me. And so I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a community like that to just help each other work through trails in Houston? Because there are trails outside of the city and I am in Texas. So there's hill country and there's a lot of trail systems throughout there. So I'm thinking, how nice would it be to have a community to train more with so I don't go out on trails by myself. Would you mind if I asked you about your social media? Because you do have such a great social media on Instagram. And I'm just curious about how you've sort of managed being really out in the open and talking, as you've pointed out, authentically, but also keeping some barriers up. Yeah, that's actually been probably one of the most difficult things for me to balance out. At the beginning, when I started dabbling in social media, it was mainly for blogging reasons and just really trying to see what my niche wanted to learn about. So it was just kind of like consumer research, right? (laughs) That's what I was doing. Um, And I think when my trials build up, that's when I really started to create more content around my story and telling my story so much more. People were so interested in what I was pursuing. So I thought, I just don't want to be talking about running all day. Like there's so many things that I want to talk about here. So I just started sharing my story more. And I think in starting to do that, it really gained a lot of trust from people understanding like what was my relationship to running? Why did it mean so much to me? And so forth. And so in that buildup, I really wrestled with what does this mean? I think that was like the whole question that I had in the trials. Like, what does this mean? Like, why does it matter? Like, it's just a time thing. And so for me, it was more of, again, representation and really being able to say, like, I could do hard things and not relapse either. Like, I'm allowed to have really high goals. And I think that was always a thing that was holding me back was the fear of relapsing. And now being like 10 years in recovery, I'm pretty like, all right, like, If it would have happened, it probably would have happened earlier. And so really understanding much more about addiction and recovery now over the last couple of years, I feel so much more equipped to tackle challenging career and life things. I think in my social media, I really try to share as much as possible with them. But the line there is, if I'm currently going through a struggle period, I don't share that. I don't share an open wound at all. I only share when it's been healed. Being able to really capture the whole story for people when it's finally healed is much better and more fruitful. Oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, have you ever felt weird posting so much? Um, I think that the beginning I did, I felt a little subconscious, like people were going to think like, you know, who does she think she is? Or like, she's such an intention hogging person. But people who really know me know that I'm very quiet. I'm demure. I'm very introverted. And I will say like, I would prefer to be at home on a Friday, Saturday night cooking for myself. The only difference is that I'm very outgoing. My goals are so big, I have to be outgoing and pursue them or else I'm always wrestling with this internal struggle. But it's interesting, too, that you're willing to stand up and speak up because you think it's so important. Yes, I will say, like, I am very outgoing and maybe a little bit, I guess, like, I go against the grain. But it's funny, I started working with a sports psychologist over the last year, and she really affirmed for me, like, you're somebody who just bets on yourself and everything that you do, you bet it for yourself. And that's been probably probably the most healing thing to hear from somebody else because I I had never really thought about it in that way. And so I just feel like 
well, if my only purpose here then is to represent other people and to inform other people the horrors of experiencing an eating disorder, then so be it. Then that's what I'm going to do and I'm not going to stop talking about it and I'm not going to stop sharing it. Even if my colleagues think that it may not be professional, who cares? Because at the end of the day, I have to live in my body and I have to live with the things and the values that I hold here on this earth. So why not just talk about it and help people in this journey? That's fantastic. Do you have as a parting words, any advice for listeners who might want to be thinking about their nutrition and their running? I'd say, what do you have to lose? If you keep waiting, you're just wasting time and you could cause yourself some heartache with your running because if it means that much to you and it hurts when you don't perform well why not just invest and work on it with somebody who is just as invested with you yeah it makes a real difference to work with a professional yeah it does i've had coaches my entire life so (laughs) like i would say i have the success that i have and i feel successful because of them i've had coaches since i was in first, second, third grade. Yeah. Like I've had coaches around me my entire life. So, I mean, I still use a coach. I use a sports psych. Like when I'm not supported, I'm not a hundred percent. And so I don't know how people get through life without support. It's so funny that you say that because I love having a coach. I have a coach right now. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think like, why can't I do this on my own? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But I mean, it makes sense. Like I just got lucky that I was an athlete and I've seen the benefits of having a coach. Like what luck did I have as a kid? Like how lucky was I to have coaches throughout such important periods of my life? And even in college, I had coaches, I had a dietitian, I had a therapist. When I was in grad school, I was really struggling because I didn't have any of those things. It wasn't until I came back to athletics where I finally had a coach. And then I've had several coaches too. But even then, like just having the support in other people. And I'd say like I flourished in the pandemic because I had a mentor. I had a therapist. I had a coach. Like I had even a physical therapist helping me through my injury. Yeah, so I see the power in asking for help and getting support. Sometimes for me, it's just, you know, like having somebody else to talk to about it. I I don't want to diminish it by saying it's a sounding board, but some of it is that. Yeah. Well, I really think sport is the vehicle for for self-realization and self-exploration and for really understanding yourself. How are you not investing in multiple people helping you into self-actualization? How are you just relying on yourself 100%? Like you need other people because then they bring experiences that are going to be so helpful. And that's something that I try to encourage with a lot of my clients of color is that we learn through storytelling. That's the way that we learn and we heal and we solve, we heal our soul wounds. Like that is, that is the way through true healing is by learning and reading and through understanding other people's experiences and having these stories. That's why I don't stop sharing my story because I know my community of color needs to hear it because that's how we heal. Well, it's like you reading all of those books before you did your 50 miler. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we will end there because that's awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for taking the time, you know, again, especially after Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I I know I get on a soapbox, but yeah. I love a good soapbox, I gotta tell you. (laughs) Thanks, yeah. Well, that's it for another terrific show. It's great to be here with you. Thanks for listening. You being here, sending me your thoughts, and telling your friends what you've heard and learned is the whole point of the show. A special thank you to Deanna Bellany for introducing me to Starla. Deanna is also a registered dietitian, is the co-founder of Diversified Dietetics, and is my guest in episode 86. It's so important for women to help women. The world needs so much more of that, always, so thank you again, Deanna. Today's episode with Starla is part of a little series on nutrition. There are a few more coming up, so let me know if you have any nutrition or fueling questions for an expert, and I'll ask my next guest. Find me on social at hearhersports or email elizabeth at hearhersports.com. 
We always have great shows coming up, so make sure to subscribe for free to hear her sports on your favorite podcast player so you don't miss anything. Until next time, bye-bye. Have you ever wanted to know how to win a Formula One Grand Prix? I mean, really know. Know about the driver tactics from the cockpit, the strategy calls from the pit wall, and even the mind games in the paddock. There's a lot more that goes into winning a Grand Prix than just 90 minutes of racing. So every week on the F1 Strategy Report, we're taking a deep dive into the decisions that shape every result. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato, and every week I'm joined by an expert guest from the paddock to talk through the big calls that won the race and the missteps that resulted in bitter defeat. Before every race, we'll look back at the previous year's result and consult the current form guide, and we'll be in your feed after every Grand Prix dissecting the the outcome and what it means for the championship. So for your regular hit of Formula One analysis, subscribe to the F1 Strategy Report wherever you get your favourite podcasts. The Strategy Report is a beer mogul podcast on the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name's Michael Laminato and I'll catch you after the chequered flag.